Hello, everyone. My name is Erin Purdy, and I'm the Director of Communications for the Briscoe Center for American History. Thank you for joining us today as we explore the photography of Tom Wright, whose collection is part of the Briscoe Center's holdings. Wright was a documentary photographer and manager for some of the most legendary acts in rock and roll, and his images of performers, audiences, and concert venues provide a true insider's perspective into the history of rock music from the 1960s to the 1990s. I'd like to start by introducing our two esteemed guests, Don Carlton and Jordan Zignego, both of whom are experts on Wright's career. Dr. Don Carlton is the executive director of the Briscoe Center and holds the J.R. Parton Chair in the Archives of American History at the University of Texas at Austin. He's the author of 13 books and executive producer of two PBS documentaries. And I should add that Don is proud to have served on Jordan's dissertation committee. Dr. Jordan Zignego holds degrees in architecture, American studies with a focus in English literature, and a master's in architecture. And he earned his doctorate in American studies with a focus on history. Jordan takes a multidisciplinary approach to architecture, design, and history, combining his research in cultural memory and post-World War II design pedagogy. He joined the Montana State University School of Architecture in 2021 and is the current director of the Community Design Center. And now a bit about Tom Wright before we get into our discussion. Guitarist and Rock and Roll Hall of Famer Joe Walsh called Wright the Jack Kerouac of rock and roll photography. Tom was born in Alabama in 1944, and in the early 60s, he studied photography at England's Ealing Art School, where he met Pete Townsend, founder of the rock group The Who. Wright became The Who's official photographer in 1967 and chronicled the group's development, including their farewell tour in 1991. In addition to his extensive work with The Who, Wright went on to tour, manage, and photograph legendary rock musicians, including the Rolling Stones, Rod Stewart and the Faces, the James Gang, Elvis Costello, Bob Seger, and the Eagles, to name a few. Tom died in 2022. The Briscoe Center is home to the Tom Wright Photograph Collection, which contains more than 120,000 photos and thousands of audio and video recordings. We also hold the Tom Wright Papers, which include personal correspondence, articles, clippings, and concert tour materials, such as itineraries and financial records. So, on to the discussion. Don, I'm going to start with you. How were you first introduced to the work of Tom Wright? Well, uh, Aaron, before I answer that question, uh, let me just quickly say that I'm really pleased that we're able to do this program. Uh, uh, Tom was a good friend of mine. Uh, I try to be good friends with all, with all of our donors, but Tom was a special character, uh, and uh, I have a warm place in my heart for him and was sad to see his passing uh, a year ago. Um, but uh, so I'm glad that we're doing this that can uh, really document, uh, hopefully permanently, uh, you know, uh, his collection and, and uh, celebrate Tom's life as well. Um, I met Tom, the first time I met Tom was in late 1993. Um, he was living in San Antonio at that time. He'd been all over the world, as Jordan well knows. And, uh, but at that time, he was in San Antonio. He was doing some freelance work and some things. I didn't know about him, however. And uh, how I met him is a rare book appraiser and rare manuscript appraiser by the name of John Payne, uh, who's also a friend of mine uh, and had done some appraisal work for the Briscoe Center. John called me and said that he wanted to bring up uh, this photographer by the name of Tom Wright, who had uh, been a rock and roll, quote unquote, photographer. Um, and what I and he has a collection, uh, John said, and we'd like to talk to you about it. And so we had just not long before this, well, I guess it was a few years before this, uh, had acquired, started, really initiated a program to build a news media and documentary uh, photography uh, archive. So it was good timing because we were looking to fill some gaps in our collection, and one of them was in pop culture uh, uh, and, and, you know, rock and roll even, let me just say that. And so I said, sure, come on. We had just, like I said a few years earlier, acquired uh, the archive of the great Russell Lee, who was one of the leading photographers of the, of the uh, back in the Depression. 
uh, for the WPA, actually Farm Security Administration. And uh, so we were looking for more collections. And so uh, John uh, brought Tom to my office here on campus and we talked and I looked at the portfolio. Uh, I should say that John asked me if I'd ever heard of Tom Wright before uh, he came up from San Antonio. And I said, I had to admit that I had not. I had never heard of him. Um, I would later learn in knowing Tom uh, that there was good reason for that because Tom always had a thing about uh, not commercializing his work. Uh, and uh, Jordan can address that probably a little bit later. Uh, but at any rate, I hadn't heard of him. And uh, so he came, I looked at his portfolio and, and I just immediately said, we want this. I mean, this is, this is great stuff. So that all worked out. We had some negotiations, went back and forth. It was a donation, uh, by the way. And, uh, but we finally worked out an agreement. And when I say finally, it only took us a couple of months, maybe at the most. Uh, and uh, we did the deal. And uh, we took a portion of, of his collection, uh, which is another story. Uh, Tom's, story, Tom's collection dribbled and drabbed into, uh, into the center over the years. But we had a core collection to begin with. Uh, so we had that. And uh, things moved very rapidly after that because this is an early 1994 now. I met him in late 93. In early 94, it just so happened that the Broadway version of the show uh, Tommy, the rock opera Tommy, the Who's rock opera, uh, was touring the United States. And unbeknownst to us at the time, although we quickly found out, uh, it was going to premiere in Austin uh, on campus at our Performing Arts Center. And so Tom and I put our heads together and we decided, hey, wouldn't it be great if we did a big exhibit of his photographs that relate to The Who and Tommy uh, for the huge lobby that they have at the Performing Arts Center. I was able to get the director who would go for that. They thought that was a great idea. And so Tom, who was ever the entrepreneur, uh, promotional entrepreneur back in San Antonio he had made uh, connections with a, a printer, a, a photo printer, and he was able to print. He, Tom was really into large things, and uh, he decided he would much prefer, and it is actually this worked out much better, uh, that in a space like uh, the Performing Arts Center, he wanted his photographs to be big. So he was able to get these wonderful prints, actually a fairly new process, uh, four feet wide and six feet tall. Um, and so we had a bunch of those and we put them all over the Performing Arts Center and they were a huge hit. Um, they were so good uh, that, uh, because we had a, an opening reception, I should add, uh, that was a big deal too, that really worked out well. But. Uh, the traveling director of the Broadway version of Tommy was at that show and saw the exhibit. And she came up to me and she said that we're going to uh, L.A. next and we're going to be at the Universal Studios Amphitheater. And, we, and we're going to have a big premiere and we'd love to have this exhibit. So we made a deal. We had to really hurry because it was within two or three weeks and we shipped the stuff out there. And I, Tom and I went out there, and John Payne went out there, and our assistant director at the time, Allison Beck, who was very involved in this, went out there. And uh, we put the exhibit up in the amphitheater. It's very popular. And I was delighted because so many people were beginning to see Tom's work for the first time. And it was particularly important in L.A. because the folks who came to the premiere, it was a, obviously an invitation-only reception, uh, people like Neil Simon, the playwright, was there, a number of people. John Entwistle, who was the, uh, the bass player for The Who, and, of course, Pete Townsend uh, was there. And Pete took people around to show Tom's photographs uh, there at the amphitheater. And Tom was glowing, as well he should have been. And uh, so it was really good exposure for Tom, uh, and it was good exposure for the center as well in what we were, in what we were doing. So that's how that all came together. And then that started a relationship, uh, let's see, 93. This is, we're recording this now in 2023. We're talking about 30 years. So 
So, um, Don, you mentioned that you were not familiar with Tom's work. And so um, I'm interested, Jordan, in the same question for you. What was it that led you to discover Tom's work? And what about his work was so compelling that you opted to make it the focus of your dissertation? Yeah, you know, I think when it first started, I was aware of his work before I was really aware of him. And it probably started when I was 14, listening to my dad's Who CD and learning how to play drums uh, like Keith Moon. And, you know, fast forward many years, and I was sitting down with my friend Patrick Markey, who's a producer, and he had asked me if I was interested in working on this project he had started, um, which he had had the rights to for, uh, had optioned the rights for a docu-series. And he said, do you know are you interested in the who? And it was just one of these things that happen in life where it's almost like it was planned, but it just was this uh, synchronicity or extreme coincidence. And anyway, he showed me the photographs and I was just blown away by them and that I hadn't really heard of Tom because I was a pretty big who fanboy, to be quite blunt. And when I saw these pictures, I just went, oh my gosh, you know, where, where have these been? And I think what struck me with Tom's work and what stayed with me throughout this process of, you know, writing a dissertation and really embedding myself in all of this is um, there's a humanist side to Tom's work. It's incredibly humanistic. And it was completely different than just your typical rock shots. And, you know, some of those can be fun, you know, the exploding guitars, smoking, bombs, and all of this stuff. But what's really powerful is that personal side. So in exploring Tom's work, that led you to the collection at the Briscoe Center. Um, tell us a little bit about what you found at the Briscoe Center and how the materials, even beyond the photographs, helped with your research. Yeah, well, I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of all in the photographs for me. Tom was, as Don mentioned, was such an interesting character, very larger than life. I met him one time, um, kind of spent a week with him and uh, Chris Easter, uh, who I'm really indebted to. And, you know, these people have really become family. And as getting to know, you know, Tom's work and seeing it, it's, it's really part and parcel of who Tom really was. He was this P.T. Barnum character that could sell anything, get everyone excited. And that is really brought through in the photographs as well. Uh, at the Briscoe Center, what was really critical was seeing those photographs and actually touching them, holding them, seeing the artifacts. And Tom was really kind of a pack rat. He kept everything. And I don't know, you know what that really was about, and I didn't delve into that too much, but he saved everything. There were you know, restaurant menus, uh, he had invoices. He had all of um, J.D. Souther's uh, uh, Holiday Inn expenses. He had expense accounts for all of these different places. And so when you start to look, to look at this whole, <clears throat> all these pieces together, it forms kind of a constellation. And one of the most important things with Tom was with his obsession for documentation, not only with photographs, it was also with audio. He was really interested in this audiovisual um, kind of recording anything. So there was new technology coming out that he could record audio. He recorded um, all of these all, uh, live performances at the Grandy Ballroom in Detroit, which is a key piece to his story. One of the key artifacts is the debut of the Tommy album. Um, first time it was debuted in America, The Who came to the Grandy in Detroit now, why did they come to the Grandy Ballroom in Detroit? Well, there's two reasons. One was Tom was managing the place, and they were close friends with Tom. The second was because the people of Detroit really understood their music. And so this really tells a different story than kind of a normally held belief, which is that the summer of love and all of this kind of musical revolution occurred on the coasts. Well, it didn't just happen there. It happened simultaneously. And Tom's records held at the Briscoe Center are invaluable to really understand and piece together those nuances. So Don, as 
Jordan just pointed out, Tom's work really captures the humanity of these artists. He's capturing them the way that they were. How does that dovetail with the other documentary photography that the Briscoe has in its holdings? Well, Aaron, as you well know, uh, really what we look for in documentary photography, and of course also news photography, which actually by definition is candid and real. Uh, but documentary photography, the best documentary photography from our viewpoint in terms of historical evidence, providing historical evidence, it's important uh, this, the, that it reflects reality and it's even uh, icing on the cake if it's very candid. Well, that's one of Tom's uh, really attributes is his work, is his, uh, that sort of sets him apart from many typical uh, uh, photographers who, who photograph events and performances and so forth, particularly rock and roll concerts. Uh, Tom wasn't that crazy about taking photographs of the concerts from the audience's point of view. And so what was great about Tom, and really it made me excited when I saw his portfolio, is I realized uh, uh, the great access that he had. And I mean, access to private moments. Uh, with all of these members of the bands that he covered, particularly The Who, but he also covered, you know, the Rolling Stones, the Eagles, uh, the Faces, and Rod Stewart, um, and, you know, uh, Joe Walsh. And he, in, its, in every case, uh, uh, he had this incredible ability because he was good friends with all of these people and they trusted him. Uh, and so this, his work is both real and it's also candid. It's, now, he did some posed work, of course. Uh, he, you know, he, he took some photographs that were for uh, record albums, for example. Uh, but that's a very small percentage of, 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 of the things that he did. So it, to us, it was a great acquisition from the standpoint not only of covering a very important period of pop culture, a major, major period of pop culture, uh, but uh, you know, also just the uh, the the realism and the candor of the photographs are great historical evidence. So, Jordan, building on that comment from Don about how you know how Tom was their friend, and there was this candid and real uh, relationship that is reflected in these photos. Can you talk a little bit more about? Tom is more than just a photographer, and some of the other roles that he inhabited um, with the band members and, and especially with The Who. Yeah, no, absolutely. So, you know, what was exciting about Tom, too, is that he was this participant observer. You know, he would uh, take the photos and help kind of create the image. There's, um, there's some of these side shot photos that where he's standing on the side of the stage taking pictures of The Who. And Townsend's either doing a windmill or he's got his arms out like a airplane, which was also something that came from the art school that Tom, uh, or uh, from Ealing Art School, which uh, is where Tom met Pete. So there were some of this kind of graphic design, this idea of you know having the image, not just the sound. And so Tom used the uh, camera as a tool. So he would take pictures. Now he wasn't really taking pictures all the time just to capture something to put on a wall for art for art's sake. But it was a tool where, for instance, if Townsend did something where he had his arms outstretched like an airplane while the guitar was creating some feedback, he would take a photo of that. And then he would develop it and then show it to them after the show and say, you know, this worked really well, this was pretty cool, why don't you do that again? And he had kind of this crazy, um, well, photographic memory, not to make a pun, but he had a photographic memory for this, what was happening in each of the songs too. So you could say, well, right about that second chord, you're gonna wanna do this and then let it reverb. And so he was kind of a muse, but he would also, you know, help them with their image and, um, make an interesting uh, show for people. So he understood the entertainment side. Um, yeah, he did lots of different things like that. One of the most interesting things to me is the song uh, Young Man Blues. That became a staple in the Who's repertoire in their live stage performances. 
And that came directly from Tom. Tom showed them Mose Allison. And then previous to that, when he was at Ealing Art College, Tom had 350 records. And coming from America, you know, I think it's important to say that Tom and Pete met at Ealing Art College. And, uh, and Tom was a son of a, a Air Force, uh, or he was in the State Department. And so he was living in the American base. And then when he came to college, he moved to the Ealing Art College campus. And that's where he met Pete. Well, they came from two completely different backgrounds. England had experienced a very different war than America had, and it was pretty depressed. Most families couldn't afford records or a record player. And if they did have a record player, they may have one record. So when Tom showed up with 350 records, most of them blues and R&B, a lot of Mississippi Delta blues. When he turned uh, Townsend onto that, that's when Townsend uh, really started playing music and responded to that like so many young um, British youth at the time. And so Tom was not a photographer then. He was just really interested in the music. And that's something that carries through in his photographs. And it's really important, I think, to understand Tom's photographs is that it's first and foremost about the music. And Tom just, you, just uh, injected that in everything in his life. Speaking of the music and that, that um, role that Tom played in terms of introducing the blues to Pete Townsend, why do you think the blues had such resonance for Pete? I mean, you mentioned a little bit about the socioeconomic conditions, but please expound on that. Well, I think that, yeah, I think it was the, the response from after World War II. The general consensus was that the music returned to kind of big band music of what was happening before the war. So it was almost this forgetting of saying, you know, this never happened. And I think that that can actually be seen in a lot of the Who's music, especially Tommy, with the song, um, the refrain, you didn't see it, you didn't hear it, you won't say nothing. And whereas Tom came in, again, as an American, with this kind of American optimism, where the U.S. were really the victors in the war, and that's how they saw it, and the war wasn't, um, you know, at their, at their doorsteps. They came over with a different optimism. And I think that the blues coming from America offered a different outlet for uh, these English youth. So for the Americans at that time, generally it was kind of old hat and people weren't really listening to the blues. It definitely wasn't pop music. The Americans went a different route with listening to kind of um, bubblegum music, very kind of inane stuff. And they were craving something else. And then in the England, they were craving something else too. And so they latched onto this blues. And I think what is transferred over in the blues is that deep feeling. Now, it's not to say that they had this one-to-one -one experience with um, you know, African slaves and the war of World War II. That would be preposterous. But I think what's transmitted is the feeling in that music. And I think for whatever reason, that really gravitated with them. And then the irony of it is that they repackaged it and sold it back to the Americans, um, all of the British wave. So, Don, you, um, I'd like for you to reflect on how Tom was influential in the Briscoe Center, in particular in the music collections. In what way did your relationship with Tom and his friendship with you and the center, how did that change what the Briscoe Center had in terms of its music? Well, it's, first of all, I mean, getting Tom's archive it was a, a huge incentive for us to build on that. Uh, you know, we like to build on strength, and Tom's uh, archive gave us a, a sort of a base to build on. And he also, Tom was, uh, I'd see Tom frequently over the years and or talk to him on the phone, and he would always, uh, you know, was free with his advice uh, about other people to talk to and give us ideas about how to keep working on this whole kind of initiative. Uh, just one quick example, it even came to a personal sort of a thing. Uh, he, Tom introduced me uh, to uh, Ian McLaughlin, who, uh, who went by Mac McLaughlin, who was the uh, keyboard player 
uh, for the faces and, and uh, Rod Stewart. And uh, he had moved in, had moved to Austin and Tom was in town uh, for a special event. And, and uh, the, he introduced me to, uh, to him, to Ian. He and I became good friends too, Ian McLaughlin and I. And so we, sadly, Ian died in 2014 and uh, he left all of his archive to us uh, as a result of that. Now that's sort of an indirect sort of thing, but that's the kind of influence and help that Tom really gave to us in, in building these collections. And on speaking of events, um, why don't you tell us the story about the book release party that the center held for Tom in 2007? Sure. Well, I mean, happily, there is a there is a pretty good book. I think it's an excellent book. Frankly, it should have gotten a lot more attention. Uh, the, where it's really kind of Tom's uh, memoir. Uh, it's uh, in his voice. He had a writer working with him. It's called Road Work, and it was published in 2007. And <laughs> typical, you know, it's Tom because it's extremely candid and frank. Uh, uh, he's he doesn't hold anything back. Um, Talks about his former marriage and, and, and all sorts of things, but anyway, it's a it's a really good book, and I highly recommend it. It just never really got distributed very well, uh, as far as I could tell. But anyway, we gave we sponsored the center sponsored uh, during the March two thousand and seven uh, uh, two thousand and seven uh, South by Southwest Festival, and um, Tom found out. Uh, first of all, this book was coming out, and we wanted to do something about, you know, that was uh, to push that. But he also found out that Pete Townsend was being honored uh, as a featured musician in 2007 at South by Southwest. So he came up with the idea and contacted me, and he said, you know, I can get, uh, if we can do a program, a book launch, a uh, book signing or something, I'm pretty sure I can get uh, Pete uh, to join us for that. And, uh, and he said, but we would need to have some sort of a private event. It would be best. It could be, it might be chaos uh, if we just opened it up to the public because of Pete's uh, celebrity. But anyway, that led to, Tom, Tom did in fact produce Pete Townsend, uh, but he also produced uh, Joe Walsh because uh, 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 Tom had covered uh, Joe Walsh's uh, first band, uh, The James Gang. Uh, and, of course, continued to cover uh, Joe. He also covered the Eagles with, when Joe Walsh was with the Eagles. So any, anyhow, he was able to get Joe Walsh to come. And so, uh, and then, of course, Ian McLaughlin, who was already in Austin. And we had a big launch party, a private launch party at the Headliners Club uh, here in Austin. And it was a, it was a super event. Uh, I'll never forget it. Uh, he, uh, the three of them spoke, I should say the four of them, Tom also spoke at the book launch. Um, and uh, the, uh, Tom uh, had several books with him. And one of the things that I treasure uh, is uh, Tom inscribed uh, one of his books uh, personally to me. And it's great because uh, it says, um, you know, that, that uh, this is Don's book. And let me say that he earned it, Tom Wright. And that was sort of an inside joke where Tom was simply t referring to <laughs> Frank, what he considered to be, and I consider to be, quite a bit of trouble <laughs> that we had over time in terms of getting his papers all together and, and photographs. So I treasure that book and I treasure that comment because it's sort of an inside joke that uh, he felt that I had earned a copy of this book because of our sometimes stormy relationship. When I say stormy, it was never bad. Uh, but uh, uh, Tom, you had to kind of rein him in sometimes. Uh, and that's what he was referring to. But let me say, uh, the, one of the thing, other things I treasure is um, I got a, Tom printed a personal, a photograph, a personal print that he made of Pete Townsend. And the book, this photograph is in his book, by the way, of Pete Townsend uh, walking on a sidewalk in the French Quarter of New Orleans uh, back in 1982. And uh, Pete is uh, wearing uh, Tom's T-shirt, 
uh, because he had messed up his own shirt, uh, which I'll explain in just a second. But Pete is walking down the uh, street. Tom is in front of him, obviously walking backwards. Uh, and Pete is smiling to himself, self, laughing to himself, and he has his um, right hand wrapped in an old uh, dishcloth uh, as they're walking. Well, he, the, the dishcloth was to cover a cut, a pretty bad cut, actually. Surprising that it didn't get infected because this was a dirty washcloth that came out of a bar. And the story behind that is that uh, it, the uh, Who were not playing in New Orleans at this point. They had just done a gig in Baton Rouge, and Tom was covering them. He was traveling with them. And Townsend, after that uh, concert in Baton Rouge, Townsend uh, went up to Tom and he said, you know, let's get away from here. Uh, I think they had finished the tour, or at least they had several days before the next gig. And he said, let's go down, let's run down to Fr the French Quarter and have some fun. And so they checked into uh, one of the major hotels there in the French Quarter. And frankly, uh, and this is important to understand Tom and some of the troubles that he had, they went on a major drinking binge. Uh, and they drank all, all night in their hotel. And I know all this because Tom tells the story in Roadwork and also told me, because I say it's a candid book. And, and this is also a time when when they both had very serious alcohol problems. This is publicly uh, known. T Pete Townsend has talked a lot about this. Uh, but they had serious alcohol problems, and they just drank themselves silly. And the next morning, they were still, they did an all-nighter, and they went down to a, a, a dark, small bar uh, in the quarter, this is in the morning, and in, if you know the French Quarter well, uh, there's places you can drink 24-7. Uh, and uh, so they went into this bar, and this uh, bartender, a woman, uh, Townsend said, what's the strongest uh, drink you have here? And she said, well, let me make one for you. It's pretty dangerous. And Townsend said, that, that's okay with me. I can drink anything. So the woman poured this concoction together, this sort of witch's brew, uh, and slammed it down on the uh, bar. And Townsend took a sip and started coughing and, uh, you know, uh, gulping. And she says, that's what I thought, no balls, to, to Townsend. And Townsend looked at her and grabbed the glass and drank it all in one gulp, okay? And when he did, he slammed the glass down on the bar and broke it and cut his hand. And that's how... <laughs> That's how he had the cut on his right hand. Thankfully, he didn't have a concert that night. Um, and that's what had happened. That's the backstory to that photograph of him walking and laughing to himself uh, on the sidewalk in the French Quarter. So I treasure that uh, photograph and, and uh, that story. Uh, and uh, so Tom is, as Jordan has rightfully said, uh, was definitely a character, one of the great characters in my life. And I've met a few in this career. I just want to add something else that Jordan uh, emphasized what Jordan said, and that is that the, the Tom did was a pack rat, thank God, uh, from, a, from a historian's point of view. And, and, and his collection is more than his photography. Uh, what Gen Jordan mentioned, I just want a second, and that is all the tape recordings he did, uh, which was remarkable and all the ephemera and all the other things that he assembled were, are also part, a valuable part of his collection. So Jordan, I do wanna go back and talk about the photography. We've, we've touched on, a, you know, Don just told that great story about the one of Pete Townsend walking down the street. We, you mentioned some of the performance shots that Tom would use to coach the Who on their performance. But in your research, you identify a series that you call the cinder block wall photos. And I was really struck in how you grouped those and saw their significance. So if you would, please describe the importance of those photos. Yeah, no, absolutely. And that actually comes from Patrick Coley, who, uh, you know, in Tom's um, circle of friends, he had a group of really close confidants that uh, went with him and worked on the road, and they all, in different ways, ended up in the music business. And Patrick Coley actually roomed with Joe Walsh, uh, wrote songs, and then um, ran ad agencies. And Patrick 
had a really interesting comment where he said that he had been working with Tom on developing a show called the Cinder Block Wall series. And so it never happened. And I thought that in the last chapter of the dissertation, I could use that as a way to explore that notion a little bit further. And I think that that really kind of sums up Tom's work, really. And it all boils down to intent and his access to these friends. You know, the intent that Tom had with all of this was not to sell it, not to commercialize it. Um, you know, Tom, I don't know if he would really even have seen himself as a photographer in the beginning. I don't know if that happened in hindsight, but he really was taking pictures of his friends. And that's why these candid shots are so candid. They were not just taken by surprise. Um, Tom had a camera around his neck all the time. He was taking photographs. And so sometimes he would pull up the camera and they could tell and then they might strike a pose. There's a famous photo of the faces backstage and it's you know pretty humorous, but it's also, they're in their stage clothes, but they're just backstage. And so it kind of has this, um, I don't know, cognitive dissonance where they're in their stage clothes, but yet they're in the backstage and it's all these cinder blocks. And that's really the duality of, of Tom's photographs, too, is it's, it's placing these celebrities in a um, you know, pretty mundane setting and kind of showing like this really is what celebrity is about. It's not that fantastic. Um, and I think reminding people that these are just you know, people and, and Tom just saw them as people. They were his close friends. I, I find that to be pretty interesting and aside of this whole kind of celebrity culture that we have that's not really shown. Um, you know, even with having Pete Townsend in Austin and having, you know, you have to have a private location because it could get out of hand. Well, Tom was at all of these places with these people and um, he was essentially in that kind of private group. And so they let their guard down because they also knew Tom wasn't gonna sell the pictures. So it just creates this, again, a very human side to his photography that I think is really important and does remind us um, or give us a different memory of uh, through these photographs. Yeah, you, you write that he, um, you talk about intent and his intent being so critical to his work and you write that what he is ultimately getting at in his photographs of rock stars, his friends, is truth. And to me, that was you know really interesting perspective that he's stripping away the celebrity and he's going for the truth. And certainly that's something that connects with our documentary photography holdings at the Briscoe. Yeah, no, absolutely. One of my favorite photographs of Tom is, I think it's in the Four Seasons where it's Pete Townsend on the phone in bed and it's probably a shot taken at you know six in the morning or something. Well, the reason that's one of my favorite shots is that there's no one else that could have taken that. You know, even like Ken Regan, who his book, I think he has a book called All Access, and it's about his access to these bands. Well, Ken Regan could never have gotten that shot as, you know, I was talking with Patrick Coley about this again, and he wouldn't have been able to get that shot because he would have had to knock on the door and get in and say, I want to take a photo, and Townsend would have said, no, go away. But because... Tom was touring with him. He was sharing a suite with Townsend and just walked in there and snapped a photo. So there are these shots that are because of his access and his friendship. And this isn't just a, you know, friendship with a small f. It's a 40-year, 50-year friendship that happened. So there were many, many years there of people understanding who Tom was and that he wasn't going to just snap a photograph and sell it. And again, I think that goes back to the intent. It was, again, part of whatever Tom had that he just felt that he had to document everything and record everything and keep everything. And as Don mentioned, thank God that he did because now it's there for posterity. And I was really grateful that, that, um, that this exists and that the Briscoe Center is there to have such a phenomenal archive and just one of many. And I think that we've... we've kind of touched on some of the reasons why Tom wasn't perhaps as well known, as renowned as some of these other rock and roll photographers, but certainly your research points to 
um, you know, that he deserves more recognition. He deserves to be in the pantheon of great rock and roll photographers. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I think that it's just about marketing. You know, his one book that was produced, great photographs, great stories, not well marketed. So I don't know if, I mean, I believe it is just a marketing thing. And, you know, it was also part of Tom, though, too. He didn't want to commercialize on this, so it wasn't. And Don, could you speak to how, you know, just as Jordan's research is shining a light on Tom Wright's work and, and trying to get that kind of understanding and recognition that he deserved, um, how does Jordan's work complement the mission of the Briscoe Center? Oh, my gosh, uh, Darren. Uh, <laughs> Jordan's work is almost a case study uh, in what we like to see. Um, I mean, the whole point of going out and getting these collections, or in, Tom, in Tom's case, bringing them to us, um, is about uh, gathering the, the raw evidence of history uh, in, in American studies or whatever you, however you want to look at this. It's, it's interdisciplinary as well, not just history. And uh, the reason we have it is to facilitate teaching and research. Uh, and, you know, particularly research, because as historians have a, a saying uh, that where there are no records, there's no history. There's other things like folklore and, and that sort of thing, but not history based on evidence. And so uh, the, the record is absolutely essential. And uh, that's the reason we gather these materials. Jordan's work with this collection and is, is, like I said, it's a case study for us. It's uh, music to our ears because Jordan was able to uh, go through the collection. Well, we made it available uh, and it produced a dissertation. What could be happier for us? Uh, I don't know if writing the dissertation was so happy for Jordan. It wasn't for me, Jordan, when I was writing mine. But <laughs> at least I, got, I was happy to have it finished. And, uh, you know, that's the kind of thing that we hope for uh, when we get a collection. I often say to people whose collections that we get, I said, you know, one of my big things here is not only bring attention to your work uh, and really create a legacy, but it's also uh, to see serious studies uh, uh, done. And, and jo Jordan has done that, and he's done it in an exemplary way. And I'm hoping I'm going to go on record here and encourage Jordan to maybe uh, shoot for a, a book a little bit later on. Uh, so go to go to it, Jordan. Uh, I want to say one other quick thing, if we've got time, uh, Aaron, yeah. uh, go back to the 2007 uh, road work uh, book launch. And it, it was also and I talk about case studies. It was a little bit of a case study about uh, Tom's relation for me personally, because I was right in the middle of it, uh, per, uh, how Tom re related to these great stars, these great celebrities. Uh, and, and how comfortable they were with him. I, could, I was there present with them. And they were all buddies, like Jordan is saying. And uh, the other thing is I had a very uh, enjoyable time being able to sit with uh, Pete in a private room there at the Headliners Club before we uh, did the program. And, and uh, Tom was with us, and, and, and Pete looked at me, and he said, you know, I'm so glad... So I don't do these things, uh, and he said I'm so uh, I would do it. I don't do it for Tom, of course, but also the fact uh, that we're doing this as a private thing, and that you're that you're recording it, is appeals to me greatly because I can really relax and and be myself. And this is literally from Pete. Uh, I can be myself and see a good friend, and and you know, and and I, it was just interesting to see that that relationship. As Jordan said clearly, we're talking about a relationship that's going back forty or fifty years, uh, and he had the same relationship, not as long a period of time, uh, with Joe Walsh and uh, Mac McLaughlin as well, and they just had a great time because they were in their own element. Uh, I remember watching them; they just snarfed up the uh, uh, buffet. Uh, just with great fun and relish, and they just were relaxed in themselves. Uh, it could be themselves, I should say. So it, it was interesting for me to see. I learned a lot about his relationship with those folks, which told me some more about how he got this access and how the, he got those photographs, as Jordan was pointing out about 
about Pete in bed. I, I agree with Jordan very much. I don't think anyone else could have gotten that photograph. Okay, well, we're gonna wrap up for today. And I'd like to thank Don and Jordan, not only for participating in our conversation, but also for your work to bring Tom Wright's work the recognition that it truly deserves. If you're interested in seeing more of Tom's work and in addition to what you've seen in the program today, I'd like to invite you to look at the links below. We've got hundreds of Tom's photos in our digital media collections and more information on our website. So please feel free to explore and see more of Tom's work that, as we've discussed, really does deserve top-level recognition. Thank you for joining us today.